morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where and when you're watching this. My name is Anthony Kinsler II, and I'm excited to be moderating this panel on preparing our communities to address the climate crisis with science leading the way. The impact of global warming is creating a climate crisis that we are just starting to truly feel. The devastation uh, of unusually strong and frequent hurricanes coming across coming ashore across the south, the winter vortex that shut down Texas, droughts across the Midwest, and fires up and down the West Coast. These are just the beginning if we don't stand up, step up, and make the change, right? To make the change that is necessary, we are talking about retrofitting over 150 million homes, 5 million commercial buildings, changing every school bus, public transportation and personal vehicle to run on electricity and creating the infrastructure to support these electric vehicles. Even small things like lawn equipment will need to be changed to electric power. However, changing everything to electric power isn't, is just one part of this. We also need to change how we generate electricity. From all the talk about solar and renewable energy generation over the last decade, it still makes up only 20% of our electricity. We need to get to 100%. This is the decade to achieve all of that I just mentioned and more. This is our put a man on the moon moment. Mm. This is our World War II, everyone behind the effort movement. I am joined today with three leaders who are standing up, stepping up, and making a chain in the change in the areas of, of their expertise. Dana Claire Redden in solar energy generation, Dr. Regan Patterson for the air quality and transportation, and retired Brigadier General David Turner for water. The format will be, will be a discussion driven with me putting the questions to steer the conversation. But before I let my esteemed guests introduce themselves, I should probably tell you a little bit about myself. I graduated with a bachelor's in civil and environmental engineering from the North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. So shout out to all my Aggies out there. <laughs> <laughs> I went on to complete my master's and PhD from Stanford University. My master's focused on designing and constructing sustainable buildings and operating them efficiently. For my PhD, I created a more accurate and scalable method to identify inefficiencies in a single family home by utilizing statistics typically used a, in social sciences like psychology and epidemiology. Since then, I've been wearing several hats, all with the effort to accelerate our transition to a clean energy economy. I'm a lecturer at Stanford University, where I teach two courses, Racial Equity and Energy, and Quest for an Inclusive Clean Energy Economy. I consult with Clean Energy Works, a nonprofit striving to accelerate investment in clean energy solutions. And lastly, I'm the founder and CEO of Gemini Energy Solutions. We provide investment grade energy audits for the small, underserved small commercial building sector. I will go into more detail about the importance of investment grade energy audits throughout our conversation today. But without any further ado, let's get this started and I wanna pass it over to Dana. Thank you, Anthony. And thanks everybody for tuning in. Thank you to my amazing esteemed panelists and thank you to Abeya uh, for hosting. Very excited to talk about this critical topic. I'm Dana Claire Redden. I'm the founder of Solar Stewards. We're a social enterprise that connects renewable energy markets to, to marginalized and under-resourced communities. So that means BIPOC communities, that means Black communities. That means those that haven't had the opportunity to really jump into this wave of this, I love how Anthony described it, our, our, our moment, our decade, uh, to get a pop in with this, this clean energy movement. Um, so our, our program really is leveraging that private sector investment. We've seen companies step up and, and make a change and say, we're gonna do 100% renewable, we're gonna do you know all that. So what does that even mean? Uh, well, it means that they're outfitting their data centers and their facilities with on-site solar energy, but it also means that they buy renewable energy credits. So we're giving them the opportunity to purchase these credits in our communities so that our communities can benefit from that influx of investment and we can create resiliency hubs and more distributed energy applications in our communities. 
uh, so we can showcase uh, uh, opportunities for more green jobs, uh, so we can create resiliency for grid power events, so we can include STEAM and STEM learning tools uh, in applications to school districts, municipalities, libraries. And so we can lead, we can lead on that. Um, so that's Solar Stewarts. Thanks again for having me. I'm looking forward to this discussion. General Turner. <laughs> Well, uh, Anthony, uh, thank you. And it's really uh, a great privilege and honor to participate in today's uh, session. I want to thank uh, Dr. Tyrone Taborn and Career Communications uh, for affording me this great opportunity. And also my uh, panel members, uh, I'm excited to participate uh, in this uh, important uh, topic of climate change. Uh, I spent 33 years in the United States Army. My last four years, I served as the uh, Regional Commanding Generals in the South Pacific Division out of San Francisco and the South Atlantic Division out of Atlanta. I had, had many opportunities to work on uh, water related issues. I served on the Coastal Engineering Research Board. That's the US Army Corps of Engineers uh, platform that studies the, uh, the effects of tidal waves on our coastline. Mm -hmm. I also had the opportunity to work the uh, Alabama Coosa Tallapoosa Water Control Manual, where I'm the signatory of that document, as well as the uh, Atlantico de Chalucci Flint Water Control Manual, where I'm also the signatory of uh, that document. I had the great privilege and opportunity to go to Brazil. I signed an international agreement where the uh, Mobile District uh, gave technical advice to the country of Brazil on how to manage sedimentation in the river. So, uh, it's indeed an absolute, again, privilege and honor for me to have this opportunity to speak uh, today. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and last but definitely not least, Dr. Reagan Patterson. Hi, so thank you so much for having me. My name is Dr. Reagan Patterson. I am the Transportation Equity Research Fellow at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation in DC, where I conduct policy analysis and research at the intersection of transportation, sustainability, and equity and analyze policy solutions that can positively impact the Black community. Additionally, I've recently started Reagan Patterson Consulting to provide policy analysis and research to help folks in the fight for livable, environmentally just futures. And this is really the motivation for my work. It's really rooted in history and a fight for livable futures, particularly livable Black futures. And I come to this work from an academic focus in, on environmental justice. So I earned my BS in chemical engineering at UCLA and my MS and PhD in environmental engineering at the University of California, Berkeley, having selected over Stanford, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> Much to my chagrin. <laughs> um, my dissertation research focused on air quality, sustainable transportation, and environmental justice. More specifically, I modeled the impact of transportation and land use policies on air quality and EJ outcomes. And while I received academic training in both chemical and environmental engineering, I came to truly understand the human consequence of transportation and environmental related policies and practices through the work, well, particularly the work of black women environmental justice organizers fighting for and reimagining a world conducive to livable black futures. And this includes women like the late Ms. Marie Harrison of Green Action for Health and Environmental Justice, Ms. Margaret Gordon, the co-director of West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project, Dr. Beverly Wright, the director of the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice, and Jackie Patterson, director of the NAACP Environmental and Climate Justice Program. And so when I think of addressing the climate crisis through science, I think of how we can use data, data analysis, and policy research in service, to, in service of community and push policy that improves the conditions and community preparedness of EJ communities. And as Representative Cori Bush mentioned when introducing the Environmental Justice Mapping and Data Collection Act, without data, it doesn't exist. So it's important to use science and data to not only quantify the current um, state, but use predictive modeling to ensure climate just futures. And I look forward to being in conversation with the panelists on how science and technology can support community visions for livable futures. Yes, thank you, thank you. I think that's a great segue. Uh, as everybody introduced themselves, I think there was a little bit about what you're doing to slow climate change right now to address the climate crisis. But I want to give you an opportunity. Uh, I'll start with you, uh, General Turner. Around what specifically, how does this impact your work, impact climate change or 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 pr protect our communities from climate change, I guess? Well, Anthony, uh, thanks so much. And I'm really excited that there's educators today uh, because I think really it starts with uh, educating 
uh, the general population on the uh, impacts of uh, climate change. And so when I when I think about that, I look at you know what I'm doing today. My company is Three Eternal Associates. What I do is I consult uh, companies on uh, water and water related uh, issues. Uh, for example, I have uh, a couple of clients. One is Dawson Associates. They assist companies in getting four or uh, regulatory permits. I'm also working with a company called Hyperloop Transportation Technology. Uh, what, what they're doing is they're looking into how do you move people and supplies from one location to another in this fuselage looking uh, infrastructure underground. So for example, uh, going from the uh, city of Cleveland to Chicago in uh, 30 minutes. So I'm a contributor mm. for Hyperloop uh, Transportation Technologies. Why is this important? Well, it minimizes the uh, release of greenhouse gases. And as most know, my focus area is water. Uh, our oceans absorb a lot of the effects of the greenhouse uh, gases. It's, it's interesting when you look at, you know, how nature responds. Uh, a couple months ago, I was reading an article where they started finding sharks in Monterey. Well, why are sharks mm -hmm. going to Monterey? Because the water is getting warmer. It's causing the sharks to, to migrate. And so through our Hyperloop Transtech technology, they're using this technology that's energy uh, independent. Uh, it works off of solar and magnets. And more importantly, it reduces uh, greenhouse gas. So I think there's a couple ways you can approach climate change. One is through resiliency and another is through mitigation. I'll be more than happy to talk about that uh, later on in today's session. Uh, yeah, so we'll definitely you. get into that. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Dana, you know, I think one of the things he also mentioned was, you know, the water. He talked about Flint and other places and how one of the issues I see is that we just don't have enough money in our communities. Right. And and you you kind of touched on this a little bit, but go ahead. Take us a little more. Sure. Uh, it's, it's critical that we build wealth in our communities uh, because of systemic oppression. We haven't had quite the opportunity that should have been afforded to us uh, in previous generations. So I think this is a, a great opportunity in this revolution uh, to really take a, a big uh, part uh, in, in making sure that these systems that we build are uh, use, utilizing our, our Black-owned businesses uh, and delivering um, revenue to our community. So, so what that looks like uh, for me personally, I specialize in, in distributed generation. So that's rooftop stuff. Uh, DR is distributed energy resources, another term for the same thing, where that uh, generation is localized near the load. Um, and so that affords a, a lot of benefits, resiliency I mentioned, um, but I'm, I'm super excited at, at skipping forward, I think a couple, couple topics, questions here, but the future of energy for prosumers to participate in a peer-to-peer uh, -peer energy marketplace, really exciting. So, so that means, you know, you're not just a, a consumer, uh, you know, from an entity where you're renting the power indefinitely, like our, our current centralized utility model. Uh, but because I've got assets, solar assets, or even, you know, maybe even a wind asset, can, considering how that's applied, um, I'm able to take part in these energy markets, selling my energy across the street. Uh, and vice versa. So this is all coming together. I, I, I'm a strong proponent that this is dis distributed energy resources are going to play a, a huge role uh, in in our energy future. But that also creates a revenue stream, right? So savings savings is very great for solar. People want to know how much money does it save me. In the future, we're going to be talking about how to monetize these assets. Uh, and creating that opportunity for revenue, which is why I'm, I'm so dedicated to making sure our communities have these assets, not only to you know create savings and resiliency, but in the future to be able to take part. And, and you can just look up FERC 2222, an order that came down last year, I believe in September, that really signaled to the market that distributed energy resources are going to have more of a say and a, and a play in, in our future. So 
you know, in addition to that, utilizing black businesses um, to do this infrastructure work, I think is very critical. And I'm very excited to see that there's leadership that's making that a priority right now. Absolutely. So Dana, you, you touched on wealth. Um, I'm going to lean over to you, Dr. Patterson, on uh, uh, health. <laughs> yeah. And so I guess I want to connect my answer to health with the wealth aspect because it's all connected to and um, access to resources. And so currently with our, again, I focus on transportation and with our inequitable transportation system, people cannot access economic opportunities. And in terms of health, we're seeing right now, particularly with COVID, people cannot access um, COVID vaccination sites because of a lack of transportation. And so it's all connected to, or I should say transportation systems play a huge role in essentially every aspect of the live experience, economic um, opportunities, as well as health. And so focusing more on the health side, we see the um, adverse health effects of our transportation systems. Since they were, for instance, urban freeways routed through communities of color, particularly black communities. And so we're seeing um, high asthma and other adverse health rates um, in black communities. And then in addition to that, just being exposed to certain things um, because of these highway routing systems, um, we do not have walkable communities. Um, we are dependent on cars. If you do not have a car, how do you get to the doctor? Um, how do you get to the hospital? And so, um, so for my work, I look particularly at, on how transportation um, produces systems where we cannot access these resources, any kind of resources. And so when we talk about climate, we have to talk about transportation systems um, broadly and comprehensively um, in terms of its contribution since in the United States, it is the made most um, or largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions at 28% of our greenhouse gas emissions. And so that's one component. However, there's also the co-pollutants that adversely impact our communities. And then there's also just living conditions and how we cannot access services. Yeah, so for those listening, if someone in your family's got asthma, it may not just be like, oh, you know, that's just people in our family have asthma. It could be because of where you live, because of the pollutions coming from your transportation and the, other, and the fossil fuel generations in near your community. So just think about that, all right? Uh, when I think about kind of the scale of what we need to transform, transportation, re renewable generation, water protection, uh, think about the number of jobs that need to be created for that, right? And, and the, lack of, uh, the lack of jobs that we have right now for my industry, energy auditors are how you identify the inefficiencies in a building. But we don't have enough energy auditors to reach all the buildings that we need to reach, right? One of the things that Gemini works on is finding a way to use technology to increase the, the number of people who can do an energy audit on a small commercial building. So instead of depending on an energy auditor who takes months, uh, who has years of experience, takes months to train, uh, we kind of have anyone anywhere conduct an energy audit. Right? I want to jump to kind of looking at our, each of your channels, right? Talk uh, think, to the, have everybody understand a little bit more about what's something exciting and what's something challenging in, in the work that you're doing uh, that for the future of making 2020 the climate decade, right? Uh, Dana, I'm going to start with you. Well, let, let me start with the exciting. <laughs> um, I love Gen Z, man. I just really appreciate it. I got this side part, right? And, you know, um, <laughs> so I'm a millennial technically, but uh, I love Gen Z, just the fresh uh, innovation and attitude, um, their ability to really uh, disseminate information um, is very impressive. Uh, I, I'm just, I, I really appreciate their fresh energy, right? Um, and so I'm very excited about the opportunity at some point in the future. I mean, where I can say, you know what, I've done my, I've made my mark, I've, I've done the work and I'm gonna pass it on to this very capable generation that's going to build off of just, just like the generations, you know, before uh, us for civil rights um, and, and, and earth movements. I mean, I think Earth Day, how, I think, isn't this like a, the, what is this anniversary of Earth Day? It's a big one, isn't it? Um, this week. Um, somebody Google that. 
Um, <laughs> but that being said, you know, we're all just building on, you know, the legacy of, of this work. So I'm excited about uh, Gen Z and, and what they're they're doing now and what they will continue to do. But that's what I thought it was 50 years. Thank you. Wow. Wow. 50 years. It's That's something to really, really reflect on. Um, but challenging. Maybe conversely, um, some of the incumbent industries, some of the you know the antiquated ways of thinking, whether that's you know racism, um, or whether that's just holding on to those you know uh, outdated models that aren't serving us, uh, it's always a challenge. Uh, I get that change is difficult, but you just can't stand in the way of progress. Um, so that's a challenge, and so uh, I'm, I'm fortunate and blessed to have the opportunity to really juxtapose those two whenever I get a little exhausted by the status quo um, and rigid thinking, then I can kind of refresh myself with innovators. And again, you know, it's not confined to age. You can have an open mind or a closed mind at any age. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that question, Anthony. No, absolutely. And Dana, you act like, you know, you're not going to be one of the people bringing us through this decade. Like you almost retire age. Come yeah, on you know, that's <laughs> hey, if it came early, I wouldn't be. No, I, I love this work. It keeps me going, but it is tough. Um, so anyone who likes a challenge, hey, you're not going to be bored in sustainability. There's always something you can yep. figure into. And you're definitely going to have a job for a while too, right? Mm -hmm. um, General Turner, uh, what's something exciting, what's something challenging and kind of the work the space that you're we're operating in? Well, well, there's a lot of things uh, exciting. Uh, I'll, I'll start with uh, the challenging first. I think when you look at uh, climate change, look at greenhouse uh, gas release, you look at the impacts it's having uh, on our climate, I believe it is a, a national uh, security issue, uh, really at the global level. And mm -hmm. you look at the flooding that's taking place uh, along the Mississippi River, you look at the um, the amount of extreme events we're getting, like the uh, hurricanes. I had a chance to uh, experience uh, hurricanes when I was a South Atlantic Division commander. Had a chance to walk the ground with uh, governors in Florida and in North Carolina. So, so you you really see the real impacts of climate change. You know, we used to talk about you know five hundred year flood events. Now is coming at a much shorter duration. And so, you know, how do we, you know, posture ourselves to be uh, resilient while mitigating uh, the effects of climate change? I think it's a, a two prong approach. You have to uh, be resilient. And I talked about a little bit earlier, uh, one of the ways we can do that is putting mangroves along our coastline to absorb uh, CO2 and some of the, uh, the tidal effects of beach erosion. Also, I uh, think there's other things we can do to mitigate, like reducing uh, greenhouse gases. I don't think it's one or the other. It's a systems a system approach in everything that we do. Uh, some of the uh, exciting things, I just recently wrote a blog on uh, Biden's proposed infrastructure bill. It's good to hear Dr. Patterson talk about infrastructure. I think that is an opportunity uh, for us. And no one knows if the bill is going to get through Congress. But in fact, I just heard it was renamed the Jobs uh, Act. But there's $623 billion set aside for transportation uh, infrastructure. I see that as an exciting uh, opportunity. I, I, you know, whenever somebody says, well, there's X trillion dollars worth of money going here, you know, some can always argue that, but Bloomberg put out a report that there's going to be trillions and trillions of dollars put into infrastructure uh, by the year 2050. So, so how do we take that opportunity and create climate change? Well, I'll give you a real good example. Uh, when I was the uh, commanding general for the South Pacific Division, I went and visited a port, uh, Redwood city port in california and i talked to the port director and he was constructing a pier and he says well 
I have enough money to construct my pier at this height, but I'm going to raise it two feet so that I can uh, accommodate uh, climate change in the future. Well, that investment is going to probably save him uh, tens of millions of dollars down the road. So, so how do we put ourselves where we think about climate change in the beginning, vice and afterthought? Uh, thank you. Awesome. And I wanted two things uh, before we jump to Dr. Patterson. One is for those who don't understand, the 500 year event is a kind of a civil engineering term that expresses how frequently something will occur. So if you have a 500 year flood, that means that we're only expecting that to occur every 500 years. And what yeah. we're seeing with climate change is that uh, instead of it happening every 500 years, we're seeing it happen every five years. right? <laughs> and so this is kind of the impacts of climate change. And we didn't design our cities and our buildings to deal with 500 year floods. We designed it for 10 year floods, 50 year floods, right? So these are the challenges. And then when we start thinking about that, it's also the cost of fixing these things. So his, his example about raising a peer higher, we're, being, we're using science and technology. Uh, Dr. Patterson talked about this earlier, right? Projecting what's gonna be happening in the future and building for that future versus building for the reality right now. Uh, Dr. Patterson, something exciting and something challenging in your, uh, in your space. Yeah, I would say what is exciting and challenging are two sides of the same coin for me. <laughs> um, and it both comes down to, I guess the exciting side is how this climate, um, how the climate crisis is currently being addressed in a way that addresses the many intersections of climate. And so you're seeing folks come at it from a racial equity perspective, an economic equity perspective, a gender equity perspective, um, a sexuality equity perspective. And so all of those kind of perspectives have been integrated into the climate uh, movement. And so realizing that in order to have these climate just features, we have to address all of them. And so that brings me to why it's also a challenge. Um, and so for instance, in the Washington Post today, they had an article called car is a symbol of freedom, not if you're black. And so mm -hmm. we talk about transportation and for me and my work, cars have always been sites of harm and vehicles of oppression. We talk about the health component of it. We talked about the climate component of it. And then we see the policing component of it. Um, for instance, with the Derek Chauvin trial, George Floyd was pulled out of his car and that's how the police got him when he was sitting in his vehicle. And there's so many others, Philando Castile. And so it's always been these sites of harm. And so livable futures require us to address each of these concurrently, because again, we're not gonna have livable futures if we do not address each of these components um, um, inter like concurrently. Um, and so, yeah. so. Excited because we're realizing how it connects to each aspect, but also a challenge because really realizing the magnitude of work that needs to be done for livable and just features. Yeah, I, I, hear, I hear that all the time. People just don't fully understand. And that's why I started off this uh, panel with the numbers, right? Just some of the numbers that we need to uh, reach. Dr. Patterson, I want to keep you going um, and uh, Give us an example of a problem that occurs when we only focus solely on one uh, channel, one one specific thing. Yeah, so um, I guess I will take an example from transportation since that's my area that I can speak to the best. And so right now it's exciting. Again, it's exciting because we see this desire from a federal level. This is the first time that a federal, at the federal level, we're seeing this push for reconnecting communities. Um, a senator, was that Merkley just released the Reconnecting Communities Act um, and you have the support of the entire um, Biden administration around redressing this, these historic inequities around transportation. Again, I mentioned the routing of freeways through black communities. Um, however, what we do see is when you address environmental issues, it contributes to to um, gentrification and displacement of our communities. And so it really speaks to, in order to have transportation equity, we also have to have housing justice because we have to make sure that folks can actually stay in their communities once we do address the um, climate and environmental issues. Um, and so we have to have also jobs. So folks now have to still make sure that we can access jobs in this clean energy economy. Um, and so really having holistic policies um, to ensure that when we do actually and hopefully fund and invest um, um, projects in 
communities historically um, adversely and disproportionately burdened by policies, when we do actually rectify this, we actually ensure that they truly can benefit through housing policies. Again, also food is something else, having access to clean and healthy food and making sure those are in these neighborhoods. And so it has to be these holistic approaches. Nice. Uh, Dana, what's something that when you only focus on this, uh, we're missing or things could get worse in other places? Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Patterson addressed it so well, just the interconnectedness of it all. And, you know, it's it's still seemingly an issue, even though we are talking about environmental justice, finally, you know, at the levels that we are, that it's still a little siloed from racial equity. It blows my mind. I, I can't see how people still need, but listen, we're here for you. We are going to connect these dots. We're going to get this right. Um, because think about it, you know, okay, wage parity. Hooray, we're finally making the same amount that you're living in a cancer cluster. You're living next to a coal ash pond. You know, you don't have clean water to drink. What does it matter what, you know, check you have direct deposited if I think, uh, again, um, to Dr. Patterson's point about the health and wealth. Right, health is wealth. I mean, I mean, critically, you need that. You, you've got to. So you can't have racial equity without environmental justice. And this is probably. I mean, it's only Tuesday, right? Uh, the fourth time. I mean, I just this week. I just it's, this is Earth Week, but I think that this is the perfect opportunity to really open that that conversation and and make sure that those connected. We just cannot have racial equity without addressing these environmental issues. Absolutely. Uh, I, I wanna, uh, ooh, uh, a little feedback there. Um, I wanted to also add that, you know, when you think about energy efficiency, you know, that's my space, and electrification, right? Imagine hy hypothetically we just electrified every building today, right? Every single building was electrified. Well, what happens uh, when there's a storm and we don't have any solar on their roofs to, for them to be, uh, for them to cool their homes or uh, heat their homes, right, in the winter. Uh, there needs to be kind of, if we only focus on one silo with an energy efficiency, we miss out on the importance of resiliency. Uh, General Turner, you talked about resiliency. So uh, I also wanna jump over to you in terms of when you only focus on one, one solution, where, where could other places go wrong? Well, Anthony, that's a great question. And if you can recall during my uh, uh, comments uh, previously, I said really it's a systems of systems approach. It's a very, climate change is very complex. There's no single answer on how to uh, address climate change. And I, I really appreciate the, uh, the comments earlier because I, I think it is a very esoteric uh, topic. Not many people uh, understand it. So, I mentioned earlier, I think, you know, educating people, uh, making them aware is one way of approaching it uh, outside of a single parameter. I think infrastructure, I think financing, science, you put all these pieces together to uh, address the uh, impacts uh, greenhouse gas is just having uh, on our climate. So you just can't look at uh, one solution because it takes a comprehensive approach to address, you know, what I said earlier, I think is one of the uh, major security issues at the global level. Awesome. I want to add a few things to it. One, for those, for everybody in the audience, so we're all on the same page, uh, cancer clusters, right? Um, those are uh, dense places where a high por por portion of people are um, having cancer or being diagnosed with cancer as a result of uh, pollution from either air pollution, uh, soil pollution, water pollution, right? Um, just so people understand that. Uh, and then esoteric is just um, a term that's used in, to describe, uh, compli it's complicated and little known, yes. right? So, um, and then, you know, one of the things I just was thinking about is kind of uh, to Dr. Patterson's point about uh, gentrification and you improve a community, right? You add green space and then all of a sudden that means that uh, the black community is, is moved out, right? And this idea of green space and black communities shouldn't be um, kind of a strange thought, 
right? It should be commonplace. It should be, of course, there's parks and green space in black communities. That's how, that's what we need to be getting to, right? Um, so I wanna go to all of you in terms of what are two characteristics, just two, that an equitable, inclusive and accessible solution should have. Um, who wants to start? I'm gonna go. I think so. I, I'll go ahead. Start. So I think our uh, resources. I mean, you gotta have resources to uh, address uh, climate change, and I, I think also you have to have uh, people that are are willing to uh, invest in truly understanding the uh, impacts of uh, climate change. So as as I talk with people, I say, okay, first you gotta define the problem. <laughs> okay, then once you find the problem, you can come up with solutions. So that's why I really am emphasizing the importance of education. Uh, you know, how many people really understand the impacts of greenhouse gases and how it's making our oceans warmer and then, but when you think about it, and I'm very careful, Anthony, in how I say this, but there's also some positive that can come out of bad always. So for example, uh, Oregon State University, uh, they're doing a study and how do you, you know, create uh, energy through uh, tidal and flow of uh, the Columbia River dumping into the Pacific Ocean. And so they're, mm. they're studying that, seeing how they can, you know, reap benefits to create energy uh, that is not uh, directly connected to greenhouse gas at least. So, so there, there are some positives to a negative of our oceans uh, getting warm. But, but essentially, in, in summation, is you got to have resources. I think you have to uh, educate people. Uh, to make sure they understand what the problem is and then allow science and technology the ability to help you uh, address those problems through some form of resiliency or mitigation. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Dr. Patterson. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess the two things for me would be community voice and participation as one. Um, for me, it's always about community led, not just community engaged, but community led. And I mentioned in my introduction, having um, supporting community visions. And so that would be one. And then the second would be reparative justice. And so um, going to another article, there was an article in USA Today saying reparations is not about cutting a check, it's about repairing a community. And so we will not be able to have justice without repairing and addressing all of the historical and contemporary inequities that continue to plague all of communities. Them? That's a lot. <laughs> I mean, if we are talking justice and equity, we can't have justice and equity if we don't address all of it. And all so, right, um, that, yo. <laughs> so those would be my two community led, particularly by communities who have been disproportionately burdened, and then also reparative justice, repairing communities, and then having futures um, in which they design. All right, Dana. I love those thoughts. And I, uh, as much as I love solar energy, uh, I think a close second would be tidal energy. Um, so I'm super excited to hear how that develops. And I guess that feeds into my answer. Um, uh, although Do Dr. Patterson, I was gonna say exactly that stakeholder engagement, uh, having diverse teams, um, so critical, um, but, um, to add some new ones to the mix, I'm going to go with innovation. Um, I think that, you know, we don't have it all figured out. What an opportunity, um, you know, and, and I love how this entire panel is filled with entrepreneurs uh, because what an opportunity entrepreneurs have uh, in this decade, right? Um, to really improve upon systems, think about innovative ways, you know, um, you know, I think that solar, again, as much as I love it, um, you know, we need solutions now. But, you know, in the future, maybe it's fusion. I don't know. You know, we, we need to think, uh, continually improve. I think as, as a human race, you know, we, we should um, already have that kind of mastered. Um, but that being said, 
now's the time. My second one would be action. I see a lot of analysis paralysis sometimes. Um, I suppose that, you know, uh, you definitely don't want to run in one direction without having all the facts. But I think at this point, particularly when it comes to equity, uh, we have the facts, right? We know what we've been cheated for so long. Uh, you know, we know what our communities need. Uh, we have the voices. Uh, and so it's time to take action on those. Certainly, uh, again, that innovation that we can incorporate can be continuously a feedback loop to make sure that, you know, we're tracking progress and we're headed in the right direction. Um, but there is no more time uh, to for inaction. Uh, it needs to take place. We've got a climate emergency. Um, and we also have this, you know, racial justice emergency, um, you know, to think that, you know, I can't go to bed in my own house without feeling like, you know, something uh, tragic could happen or take a ride, you know, to the store. Um, you know, that's just not acceptable and it needs to change right now. So all that to say, uh, innovation and action uh, on, on all of those issues. And I think we'll be off to the races. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to say for any anybody listening, if you're having trouble you know, these three folks are examples, but they're not the only ones out there. So if you're having trouble finding people of color, um, black, indigenous, Hispanic, like fill, fill in that term, people of color. If you're having p trouble finding people of color working in the clean energy space and the environmental space, then uh, that's not on them. That's on you. You need, there's, they're out there. All right. So don't use that as an excuse. <laughs> the second thing I want to add to y'all list and say ownership. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, we think about community solar and how if the community doesn't actually own it, they're, they're not reaping the benefits of that. Uh, so um, I'm just going to add ownership to to what an equitable, inclusive and accessible solution should have. Andrew, All right. Let's let's. Yeah, please. Yeah. Hey, can I uh, just I want to uh, add something mainly what both uh, Dana said, and what you have been emphasizing uh, throughout this uh, session today, and you really started off your your comments by presenting data. Uh, I once had a boss uh, tell me, a senior leader, saying, hey, without data, you don't have an argument. And so I, I believe that really uh, understanding the data and and looking at the data and saying, okay, what what are we learning from this is really important. Uh, and I noticed that throughout today's session, you made sure that certain data points were clearly understood by uh, the panel members and those that are listening. So I just want to emphasize the importance of really knowing the data and determining, okay, what direction is that taking? It's so critically important from my perspective. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Can I add to that? Please. Like um, I I appreciate that point, and I will add, and I want to add the data generated by asking the right questions. And so, a lot mm -hmm. of times in our fields, we ask questions, we generate um, data, but then, but nothing can be done with it. We now it's descriptive, but it's <laughs> not um, useful. And so, making sure that we ask the right questions to generate the data that is then usable by community, by organizations, by policymakers and decision makers. And so um, I just wanted to add that on to the great point that was just made. How do we know what's the right question? <laughs> oh, you're so funny. Uh, <laughs> the right question. So I think uh, a great start would be a point um, that I made earlier around community and community engagement. And so if your if your purpose is to really say, I want to do something that benefits society, first identifying which aspect of society are you hoping to benefit? And then who are the people in that group and what you are hoping to benefit? And so therefore, what are the questions that they actually want you to ask? What questions would actually be helpful to them? So I think it goes back to that community engagement piece to make sure that what we're asking is actually shaped by things that matter and are useful and needed by community.
<laughs> and just for everybody, go ahead. No, no Anthony, I think that's that's a very good point you you made, and uh, you know, Dr. Patterson, you did a good job, you know, answer it because I I think you know, one of the ways is you know if you're asking the right question is if you kind of stop, okay, why am I doing this? And then once you figure that out, then you can figure out the other pieces like the how and what and so forth and so on. You know, and and why is climate you know change, you know, so important? And then you know you start from there. I think you really start getting some of the good questions that's going to allow you to collect the appropriate data. Right. Yeah. And for, for everybody listening, right, I knew Dr. Patterson's, Patterson's answer before I asked that question. Right? <laughs> um, so I want to I want to jump into how do we make 2020 the climate decade? Right. This is this is our, you know, 50 years from now, 100 years from now. If we do what we need to do, there's going to be people talking about this decade. So what are one or two points? Uh, for for each of you, uh, in terms of how do we make this decade the climate decade, uh, Dana, I'm going to go to you first. Well, step up, stand <laughs> out. <laughs> uh, no, but but for real, um, I think it's it's time to uh, make your voice heard. Everybody has a role to play in this. There's no sitting out. You don't have to have crazy credentials. Um, certainly, if you're pursuing those. They're great as well. Uh, but that being said, I mean, there's just so much opportunity to really just get in where you fit in. Um, to just start, um, I think that's that's one way to really see this decade as as the monumental one that we need it to be. Also, let's let's not be afraid of change. To the general's point, um, you know, with with every crisis or bad situation, there is an opportunity. Um, you know, millionaires, billionaires, they're made in recessions. Uh, you know, when you have a crisis, sometimes it's the only way to get people to change. So it has been a rough start to this decade. I don't want to gloss over that, you know, globally, I think we've lost 3 million people. That's crazy. Um, and so, you know, let's do them a service by not letting this crisis go to waste. I think little bit of a crude expression, um, but just to recognize that this is an opportunity to build back better, as, as I think somebody has said, <laughs> um, and, and really change these systems for the better. Um, so I'm excited about that. I think that without that crisis, maybe it would have been a little bit more status quo, that, that opportunity might have been lost, um, but we have something to really um, capitalize on. Yeah, General Turner. Well, you know, I'm going to use this. Uh, I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, pieces, but I'm going to use this analogy. Uh, you know, when when you're in a combat environment, uh, the key is you want to you know slow the bleeding down till you can get to a more advanced stage of medical care. So, in essence, the ultimate goal is to. Uh, save a person's life. Well, well the same thing, and, and I talked about a lot, uh, this whole balance between resiliency and mitigation. And, you know, you know how, do we, how do we slow the process down, i.e. Uh, minimize the amount of greenhouse gas release in order to slow down the bleeding so that in the future, we can be better prepared to uh, come up with measures to uh, address uh, climate change. So, so that, that's, that's one way, I believe, uh, stay involved, uh, educate as many as you can uh, on this issue, uh, because it is a security issue and it requires us to uh, look at it from that perspective. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Patterson, one to two points of how do we make this the 2020s, the climate decade? Um, I would say coalitions. And so um, what we're seeing right now, an exciting thing that we're seeing right now, back to that point, is a lot of coalition building. Um, I will just mention, for instance, um, M for B F Movement for Black Lives is releasing their Red, Black and Green New Deal on Earth Day. And that is representing a coalition of groups from across the country for a climate agenda. 
Um, and so these coalitions, on these coalitions, there's a need for and a role for scientists and folks in technology, because again, we need the data that support community um, experiences and community um, advocacy. And so making sure that there are scientists in service of these coalitions that are again, community led. So I would say coalitions um, because there's people power in coalitions to make sure that um, things and needs are addressed. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, all right. So, you know, now we got, this is how we get to, this is how we make it the 2020 climate decade. And I want to, uh, I've been instructed to invite audience members to type in a question. If um, we have time, we'll get, try and get some answers. Uh, so if you listening and you want, and you have a question, feel free to type it into the chat. Um, but while we're waiting and, on that. And Anthony, while they're typing those questions into the chat, I, I think it's important also that we really understand the changes that are occurring and uh, the significant impacts of uh, those changes you know, and, you know, vulnerable areas like Miami and New Orleans that are kind of low lying, uh, mm -hmm. heavily impacted by extreme events uh, such as hurricanes, you know, so really uh, understand those changes and the impacts, then how do you uh, come up with uh, solutions to those challenges? Nice. No, absolutely. And I, I'm going to I'm going to throw a question to all of y'all be while because we've been talking about the, the, the need to st uh, stand up, step up and make a change. Where are some resources folks can go to to help get them started? Uh, I'm gonna start with you, Dana. Well, fortunately, uh, living in the information age, there's there's really no shortage of information. I think, you know, just be careful that you uh, have a credible source. Um, but I mean, go down a, you know, well, for, for one, uh, I would say perhaps uh, a mentor and mentee relationship, you know, find you a good mentor. Everybody can have a mentor. Um, everyone can be a mentee. So even if you're, you know, sophomore in college, you know, uh, and you're passionate, you know, a lot of learning happens through teaching. It is definitely a bi-directional opportunity. Um, so when it comes down to information, I mean, uh, yeah, I could tell you to Google something, right? But really, I think the, the best opportunity is really finding yourself a mentor uh, that you can really learn not only stats and facts, but um, more of that wisdom, how to maneuver, uh, what to say, what not to say, uh, what the industry might look like in, you know, 15, 20 years, because one fortunate thing about sustainability is that this is not stagnant. It's it's always changing. So that's an amazing opportunity. Um, so yeah, that that's that's what I would recommend. Um, can be such a rewarding experience on both sides. Dr. Patterson. Um, I would say get involved in local community to really understand what are the issues that community is facing or you may be facing and then shared experiences and shared advocacy. Um, and so joining groups, um, I know one that's getting a lot of attention nationally now is the Sunrise Movement for um, uh, bringing attention to climate issues. So other environmental groups, other environmental, local environmental and environmental justice organizations, attending teach-ins. A lot of these groups will put on teach-ins to inform community. And that's a great way to, again, have develop an understanding of what's really going on. Um, being engaged with local politics, because that will also inform um, what is the state or condition of the city or locality. Um, so getting involved in the local level decision-making um, and volunteering with community organizations. And so we touched on how this is, um, this, this problem reaches across so many different areas of life. And so getting involved with mutual aid organizations, getting involved with housing, food um, um, organizations. And so all of those are ways to really understand or develop better understanding of issues in community. And then um, issues in community, how community is 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 uh, framing their those experiences and how community is advocating for those experiences, for awesome. solutions, I should say. 
Awesome. Yes, yes, yes. I'm loving both answers. Uh, General Turner, uh, you know, you got you got other sad. <laughs> well, I mean, those are two pretty hard acts to follow. So I could just, you know, probably add just slightly to those. You know, uh, as Dana said, there's no shortage of uh, information. Uh, I think that the uh, administration is putting emphasis and focus on uh, climate change uh, through uh, several venues, one potentially the uh, Jobs Act, uh, also known as the Infrastructure Bill. Uh, President Biden has uh, appointed uh, former Senator uh, Kerry to lead his uh, global effort uh, on uh, climate change. So I think that awareness at the uh, very top will complement what both Dana and uh, Dr. Patterson are, are discussing uh, in regards to community environment. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we had one question here and then I wanna close out uh, with one of the last question my, I have, but uh, can anyone on the panel talk about specific STEM initiatives that have aided sustainable solutions in combating COVID? I can address that quickly. I think it's very interesting. Um, my uh, forte into sustainability many moons ago, uh, I got my LEED certification. And so, you know, one of just, just looking at sustainability measures within the built environment, and one of those is indoor air quality. Mm. Does not fit in great. I mean, cleaning that air up for, and, you know, that's just something to do with, with healthy buildings, making sure you've got the right ratio of fresh air to recycled air. But I think that speaks directly to uh, some of the challenges that, that uh, we've faced in mitigating the spread of COVID, having better indoor air quality. So another opportunity to see that it's all related. Absolutely, thank you. That, I think that will cover that question pretty nicely. Um, and for those who don't realize, your indoor air quality is almost always going to be worse than your outdoor air quality, no matter where you live. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so just, you know, another argument to be outside more often. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to, I also want to put out in terms of resources, uh, Cure Com Communications Group, uh, folks that brought you Bea and uh, Women of Color STEM Conference, they're creating this uh, something called STEM City. So hopefully you'll be hearing more about that, but that is a virtual world uh, where you can learn and engage uh, for free, right? So um, something that uh, one of the issues we have is there's so much information out there where um, having one central location to know that you're gonna get credible uh, information uh, is gonna be uh, powerful. Um, oh, um, one more question it seems. Uh, Dr. Patterson, to the degree that you can say, how focused would you say the Black Caucus members are attentive to this issue in general? Um, I would say very. And so I would look to the introduction of the Green New Deal for cities that was just um, introduced yesterday by Representative Cori Bush. And I do not, um, I'm not endorsing any policies. I'm just saying, uh, informing of the introduction of these policies. <laughs> And so you can see that um, Black Caucus members are, are leading on a lot of these. Um, Representative Clark also introduced a bill for electrification that actually targets Black communities, uh, low-income, other BIPOC communities to target the electrification infrastructure. And so, um, and Congresswoman Ayanna Presley is doing acts around freedom to move to have um, fair free transit. And so you're seeing a lot of caucus members leading on um, um, issues of climate, energy, and transportation. Beautiful. Well, we're gonna close out with this last question. How do each of you speak up uh, for climate change with your family and friends and neighbors? So uh, General Turner, you'll go. Well, first and foremost, I shout out the link to all my uh, uh, family members and friends uh, to let them know about today's uh, session and to encourage uh, their participation. And I think just, you know, enter into our uh, into just general dialogue with them on a routine basis, I think is one way for it. Nice, thank you. Uh, Dr. Patterson. Um, having conversations, um, providing resources, we talk about resources, a big resource is just our, the work that we do and engage with on the daily basis. So then our conversations are about that. Um, and 
uh, yeah, sharing different, uh, since it is COVID, a lot of things are virtual. So sharing different webinars and different things like that. So being a resource and sharing resources um, with family and friends. Dana, take us home. <laughs> well, uh, fortunately, you know, I've, I've got a praying grandma. And so she, she understands the stewardship uh, aspect of this movement. And so it's really been an opportunity for us to relate on a spiritual level to know that we are responsible uh, as, as a human race uh, to do the right thing. I love that. And there's organizations uh, such as Green the Church out there, um, you know, religious faith based institutions are mm -hmm. starting to lead the way in this. And we and we need them heavily involved for us to reach our climate goals and to make this a 2020 decade. So we're at time. I want to thank the three of you, um, this was even better than I hoped for. So thank you all for the time and, and just the engagement in the conversation. Uh, this panel was organized by Career Communications Group, the same group that organizes the annual Bay of STEM Conference and Women of Color and STEM Conference. So shout out to y'all and thank you all for those uh, working behind the scenes. Uh, thank you for the organizers of Climate Action Week in general. And um, we look forward to more conversations on how we can prepare our communities to address the climate crisis. Uh, and with that, uh, until next time, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, Anthony. Thank mm -hmm. you.